that a cute story. It's just like those Native American stories where the world is the back of a turtle, right? That's what we want to say because of the scientific claims today. But the church has never bought into that. Just because Genesis isn't a science textbook doesn't mean it's not full of truth. And in fact, it might even be more full of truth because it can convey very deep truths using the symbolic language that it uses. This language of cycles, this language of creation, the way that God creates human beings. And so, made in God's image and likeness is one of those really core truths that we can never ignore because it's so central to our faith. Similarly, male and female, he created them. Incredibly central to our view of humanity. We are made male and female. Made that way. It's not just random. It's not unintended. This is very much intentional. We are intentionally male and female. And it's at this point that we diverge with the secular world and where our conversations start talking past each other. Because this is the point on which most sexual philosophy will diverge from Catholic sexual philosophy or theology. Is this idea that male and female are not different. That male and female are choices, they're gender expressions, they are things that were determined by whether your parents gave you a doll or a fire truck. This is, I went to secular colleges, I took sexual, I'm sorry, I took uh, sociology classes in these secular colleges. I, I know what's being taught out there. I know what all of my peers believe, and this is what they believe. They believe in a gender spectrum, right? Somewhere on one extreme is man, and on one extreme is woman, and you can choose where in that spectrum you are, right? You can be kind of blue, you can be purple, perfectly purple, you can be kind of pink, like whatever, that's, that's where things are. And, and it's at this point that we, have to, that we have to disagree, and if we don't find a way to talk about this point, nothing else is going to follow. And so this is really the point where we have to start dialoguing with the world, because this is the point where we diverge. We can't talk about things like, uh, like sexuality if we don't talk about this first. So this is, the fancy term is, is sexual complementarity. It's this idea that male and female are separate entities, but that they complement each other. We'll get to that later, there's scripture on that. But they're male and female. God intended there to be two modes of being human. Two ways to be human. Now, in any morality class, you're going to try to hit the fringe cases, so <clears throat> generally it's pretty easy now that we have genetics, to say, okay, XX is female and XY is male. Well, there are conditions out there where you might have XXY, or I think there's even an XYY, although that doesn't... Anyway, um, so there are these things out there, these, these genetic conditions. And so in a sense, okay, well, some people would say, this is biology saying the church is wrong. This is biology saying that it's not as black and white as we want it to be. Again, it's all about the intention. It's all about the plan. God's plan, his intention, what he wanted for creation, was male and female. These other genetic disorders where you have, you know, it's hard to tell. Well, that makes it hard to have a conversation. You have to meet people where they're at, right? So you, you, you just have to encounter the world as we're given it. But it doesn't mean that the plan is any different. The plan was male and female, he created them. Two means of being human, two modes of being human that are not the same mode, right? They're, they're separated out for a reason because they're different from each other. And that difference is intended from the beginning. Genesis 1 28, the next verse. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over it. And then it has the list of birds in the air, and fish in the sea, and whatnot, and so forth. Um, <coughs> next important point. We have humanity's created. It's created in God's image. It's given dominion <coughs> over the earth. It's created male and female. And now, it's told, its mission, its first mission, is to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. So we've already heard about the dominion over the earth, but be fruitful and multiply is a new idea at this point in Genesis. And this is very key 
Because again, we have all of these divergences in Christianity and in Christian history where people were like, sexuality is bad. Let's create a Christian cult where we don't have sex ever. And then they die off in a generation, which is why they're not here anymore. Um, they, but, but it's true. It's happening. If you look at the back of your silverware, probably half of you in this room own silverware that says Oneida on the back. Oneida was one of those communities. Um, but they found a way to persist anyway, so good for them. Um, the Shaker community was the one that more people think of because their sexual ethic was stronger, but um, they shook when they prayed, so that's why they're called Shakers, but uh, they also didn't reproduce, so we don't really have Shakers anymore. So, um, be fruitful and multiply. This is a command of God. This is his intention. And so again, we have the natural law data. We have the fact that sexual organs have a reproductive use, that that's important, that if a sexual organ is in play, there should be some idea of reproduction present there. Well, this is Revelation confirming that natural law conclusion. Revelation saying this is God's intention. God's intention is for us to be fruitful and multiply. Now again, this is the plan. Not all of us can live out that plan. I certainly won't be fruitful and multiply. Like, that's just not in the cards for me. So it's looking at the deeper truths of humanity. It's not a commentary on any individual's life, but it's just saying when God created humanity, this idea of sexuality, this idea of reproduction was present from the beginning, was one of the earliest things that God talked about. Because it is very key to humanity. As all of us know, our sexuality is a very powerful force. It's key to humanity. And God wanted to clarify that very early on. If this is so key to humanity, what is the intention? And so he tells us right here, Genesis 1.28. That's the end of the first creation account. Any questions at this point? Yes? Uh, the question about um, reproduction. Yeah. If, if it can't be done naturally, yeah. and a couple decides that they're going to go to a doctor and have a procedure, but they're still intending to have a child and bring it along to the what is the church's <coughs> take on that, and mm -hmm. what is necessarily, what has been the interpretation of God's Sure, very good. Um, I'm not going to focus very much on the church's stance, because that's the what, and we're going to get behind it to the why, but I can answer the why very quickly. So this is generally the question, normally we would talk about in vitro fertilization, right? This is one of the procedures that the question is asking about. What's the church's stance on that? That sort of thing. Um, for a couple who is unable to reproduce naturally. At that point, we look to natural law, and we flip it around. Natural law, as we've been talking about it today, has been focused on the sexual organs. Right? What are these things intended to do? Well, flip it around, and instead look at how God determined human beings should come into the world. Right? This is now the data that we're going to look at. How did God intend for human beings to be created? Well, generally we look at that and we say, and especially now that we have biology. Biology is such a tool in our sexual teachings today because it really helps us understand truths that we had before that we didn't even realize. But biology says, well, you need a sperm, you need an egg, and you need them to come together, right? So on a macro level, that means mother, father, and some form of sexual act to unite these two things. And we would look at that and we'd say, yeah, this is God's plan for how that should come about. So the church's teaching on IVF really comes from looking at that and saying, <clears throat> children were intended to come about through this process. Certainly there are, there are problems in the world where not every child can, can have its own mother and father or, or you know, there are certain biological things that prevent that process from happening. But that's the goal and that's the plan we're aiming toward. And the church, in her study and wisdom, has determined that that plan is so important that to remove the sexual act from the plan is to violate the plan in a grave way. That the sexual act, when you're planning it, when this is due to intention, not to disease or to accident or to rape or you know all of these other horrible things that happen, but when it's intended, 
the creation of a new human being really needs to be done in the context of the sexual act that God gave us for the sake of reproduction, because that is so clearly his biological plan when we look at the natural law data. So that's how the church would talk about that issue. Other questions? <coughs> Richie. I would, I would add to that, correct me if I'm wrong. I, mean, I will. <laughs> <laughs> is that by doing that, you take away one of the other purposes, and that is the love and other aspects to it. It's just not a mechanical thing. It's right. not, you, but you've got an emotion there that builds into family and other aspects down the road. Yeah, the church would absolutely talk about the language that bishops use today is a child should be created in a loving environment. Um, I don't focus on that language so much for various reasons, because I don't find it helpful in the conversation, because it doesn't get directly to the thing. But you're absolutely right. When God's plan is able to be carried out, there is a beauty there in the fact that there are two loving spouses that are taking part in this means of reproduction. So, so yes, there is a beauty there. I just don't talk about it directly, because sometimes it's not helpful for the conversation. Okay, let's move on to the second creation account. So this is more God interacting as though he's a human being, in a way, right? He raises man up from the clay, there's breathing into man, he, he's like, oh, this isn't right, and he takes the rib out, and, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's a more fun story, this one. Um, but again, <clears throat> just because it reads like a children's story does not mean that it's not true, and it does not mean that there are not deep truths presented here. We just have to understand the means by which the biblical author wanted to present those truths. And so we look to the truths, not necessarily to the fun details. So, one of those truths. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So here again we have Revelation confirming the general natural law conclusion that it is not good for humanity to be isolated. We are meant to be in community. And this specifically is talking about community in general, but also man as an individual because we'll get here. This is, this is the creation of Eve. This is how the second creation story talks about man and woman, he created them. The first one just says it, right? Man and woman, he created them. That's the truth. This one kind of gets to the underlying idea here. And they're trying to explain, the biblical author, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is explaining why it's man and woman, why they were created for each other. And this is it. It is not good that man should be alone. Now, two ideas here. One, it's humanity doesn't exist in isolation. We are all connected. We are all meant for each other. But two, in a way, you can read this and say, it's not good for man to be monolithic. It's not good for man just to be male. Right? In a sense, there is something missing here. There's something lacking here. And if you look at it, John Paul II actually talks about this as being ungendered. Um, I don't think the language backs him up, but I'm also not a doctor in theology, and he's the Pope, so maybe we listen to him. But he talks about man being ungendered until he's put to sleep and the rib is taken out, and then at the creation of Eve, then humanity becomes gendered. That's what he talks about in Theology of the Body. Um, and he does that because he's trying to get to the deeper insight here. In a very real way, the deeper insight is it's not good for man to be monolithic. It's good that there are two modes of humanity. It's good that there are two genders, two ways of being human. And that's a very deep truth presented here. Not just it's not good for the man not to have community, but there's something missing when it's just... Adam. There's something not present there. And that's one of the things John Paul II really talks about. And so, what happens? He creates Eve, God creates Eve, and this is what Adam says. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And my professor made a very good, and John Paul II too, just spoke very beautifully about this. This is the most joyous exclamation, exclamation you'll find in Genesis. It absolutely is. This is bone, this at last, that at last is so important. At last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The man 
sees in front of him his mirror image, but not a mirror as a, as a copy, right? It's not, this at last is me. It's, this at last is another human being who is human, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. There's, there's something deeper there than just, oh, this is better than a giraffe, right? <laughs> you know, this is great, this is better than all those animals I was naming. There's, there's, he, there's an identity there. He's identifying himself with the other person. He's noting that they are of the same substance. Right? It's like that consubstantial word we use for God. You know, all of us in here, we are consubstantial with each other. We are of the same substance. And this is the exclamation that the man has to say, finally, finally, somebody who is of the same substance, that is, that is, that is the same, but, but not identical, not the same. Because here we have Genesis 24, the next verse. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. So, what we're seeing here is there's monolithic man. Then he is split, male and female, Adam and Eve. But then there's a reproachment. There's a coming back together into the one flesh. Through, when we talk about wife in the Old Testament, we're really talking about the conjugal act. So, through the conjugal act, they come back together. And this is truly God's intention. We're looking at Genesis and we're looking, this is God's intention for humanity. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, reuniting into one flesh. This is so key to the way we understand things. This is so key, and it's so key that he made them male and female. There's something missing when it's just male or when it's just female. They are complementary. They are two modes of being human that are orthogonal. They cannot be collapsed into each other, right? It's not, you just, you just can't. They, they are not the same, but they belong together. They are meant to be put back together. The Greeks had a, had a funny story, not a funny story, they, they took it very seriously. But uh, Plato recounts a story in his symposium where all these Greek guys are sitting around talking about love, and that's how we know that the Greeks were really, really bad with child's rights. Um, and, oh wow, didn't get enough laughs there. Not a lot of classical education in the room. Um, don't read the symposium if you don't want to be scandalized. It's really messed up. But one of the stories in the symposium is this idea that Originally, there were three types of human beings. There were, essentially, and, and they, were, they were all joined together. It's like two individuals, but, but sewn together. And so there were the two guys sewn together, and the two women sewn together, and then the guy and the girl sewn together. And the Greek explanation was, we're all looking to recreate the bond that we had before we were born. Right? We all started as these two people sewn together, and we're all looking to recreate that bond. So some, some people are trying to recreate the male-male bond, some people are trying to recreate the female-female bond, and some people are trying to recreate the male-female bond. So we're not the first society to ask questions about homosexuality, pro tip, and we're also not the first society to widely accept it. The Greeks had that way before we did. So there you go. The Christian idea, or the Jewish idea, the Judeo-Christian idea, is a little different. Right? We don't have those three that are split and then come back together. But there is a deeper truth that we're hitting that the Greeks were kind of mirroring. You know, they got it, they got it wrong, but they, they had an idea that we also have here. Humanity is not complete by itself. They are meant to come back together. Um, I don't think I have time in this presentation, but you should someday ask me how this relates to celibacy. Because that's a question that I was asking my professor when she said that. I'm like, well, you're teaching a room full of men trained to be priests, so I guess we're all deficient. But it turns out not to be true. It has something to do with grace and Jesus, I don't know. He's an important guy. Um, Genesis 3.16. So this is after the fall. So we've painted the picture of primordial man, man as he was created and intended to be. Beautiful, wonderful, fantastic. This is God's plan. Then we eat the fruit and everything goes not quite to hell in a handbasket, you know, but out of Eden at least. 
So, I put this up, and I put up the thing from Ephesians too, if you know where I'm going with this. Um, because it's important to talk about it, because we hear it out of context, and I want to provide you some context. This is a punishment. This is something that God says as a result of sin. It follows after you're going to crawl on your belly and eat dirt. It falls after it's going to really be hard to work the land and it's really not going to be fun to till the soil. This comes after. It's put in the first person. It's put as though God is saying, I am making this happen. But the language of Genesis leads us really to believe, and especially the later theology um, clarified by Christ and the fullness of Revelation, really leads us to believe that God is making a statement about the effects of sin. He doesn't force, force evil on us. He is not punishing us necessarily as letting us experience the result of sin. And so we would say that this verse in Genesis is a result of sin. It's something that happens because we sinned. It's something that God allowed to happen, just as when we sin, God allows us oftentimes to feel the consequences of that sin. He doesn't make it okay right away. But it is a consequence of sin. It is not intended by God. It is not part of his plan. So, and John Paul II calls this out, not just in Theology of the Body, but in his document on women, Mulieres Dignitatem, which, if you want to join the endowed women's group, that's what you're going to be talking about, is that document. But he calls this out as a result of sin. So, when God says, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you, this is a deficiency in creation. We wouldn't say that this is normative, and this is why the Catholic interpretation of the Bible gives us some really excellent tools that a literal, more Protestant, Calvinist interpretation is not going to give us. We can look at the context and we can say, you know what? This is not the way it's supposed to be. In fact, it's explicitly called out in Genesis that this is not the way it's supposed to be. And we'll talk about Ephesians later where St. Paul talks about this. Yeah? I noticed that Jesus came into a world to heal the damage caused by original sin, and part of that was setting a good example for other men on how to treat other people, including women. He didn't seek to dominate other women. Instead, he followed them, and he taught that respectfully Yes, again, Christ backs up this revelation. And that's this slide, which is great. <clears throat> Matthew 19, 3 through 6, Christ's teaching on marriage. It's long, I'm not going to read it to you. Hopefully you know the context here. But <clears throat> we have Christ reaffirming the revelation we already have in the Old Testament. When Christ quotes scripture, pay attention. This is the scripture that he cares the most about. Right? This is something that he's saying, not only is this important scripture, but this is also the scripture that the Pharisees haven't really gotten wrong. Or when he quotes the scripture against the Pharisees, he's saying, you got that scripture wrong, let me quote you some real scripture. This is the right stuff. <laughs> so he's saying Genesis is spot on. Here we are. Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? So, lest we fall into that heresy where we think the Old Testament is less important, or that the Old Testament doesn't matter, it's still God's word and Christ is confirming that. He made them male and female. And then, again, this is, he's just quoting Genesis, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. There it is. Again, confirming that. But what's really important here is this last line. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. He's not only quoting Genesis, but he's really reaffirming that it is the action of God. That it is the action of God that calls two people together. We use this because it's in the context of divorce, and it's the context of marriage. We use this as our scriptural basis for the sacrament of marriage especially. In this statement, Christ elevated marriage to the level of a sacrament. You can make an argument that it was already at the level, that God already joined male and female together, and they were not meant to be put asunder. You can make that argument. But because of the Mosaic Law, this is what Christ is responding to. Uh, the Pharisees are like, but Moses let us have a divorce. So they knew. They wouldn't have asked the question if they didn't know there was something amiss here. 
But Moses let us have a divorce. And Christ says, well, that's for the hardness of your hearts. This is the plan. This is the goal. This is the ideal. I'm raising it to the level of a sacrament, and therefore I'm giving you the grace necessary to overcome the hardness of your hearts. That's what this whole passage is saying. But it's important to understand this is, a, this is very much present in the New Testament. It's not just Genesis. Yeah? Oh, you're right about uh, men ruling his prediction not the way things are supposed to be because uh, it is woman who has been set of all the humans and is queen of all angels. Right, so we have, the, again, the Marian, the Marian idea that Mary is, is the uh, model of all saints is the, is the title I like for her. Um, so, so yes, it's very true. Now, let's talk about Ephesians. This one's fun because it will be read one Sunday a year, and people will write to the pastor and say, why would you ever let that reading into Mass? This is horrible. Haven't you read the Bible? And, uh, yes, we have read it. In fact, we were reading from the Bible. Um, but it happens every year. So let's, let's get it out of the way. Let's talk about it. Okay. The most important verse here is the first one. If you ignore the first verse, you've missed the whole point. The first verse is, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, that word subject, you'll notice, shows up again in the part that everybody doesn't really like, but it's up there. Be subject to one another. It's mutual. And now this is really where we get into the depth of the church's sexual teaching. And it's so clarified for us in the New Testament. And this is just the word I'm going to use for the next 15 minutes so that you leave with this word in your mind. Okay? Self-gift. Self-gift, self-gift, self-gift. Self-gift, self-gift. Self-gift, self-gift, self-gift. I've got 10 minutes. Self-gift, 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 self-gift. Self-gift, self-gift. <clears throat> The entirety of the church's sexual teaching, based on everything that we've gotten to to this point, based on the teachings of Christ, and especially based on this passage, which is why we read it on Sunday Mass, is because of self-gift. The idea behind sexuality, the idea behind man and woman being complementary, is that they are to give themselves to each other. This idea of love being part of revelation plays in here. You can look at the natural law data, you can look at some of the revelations so far, and you can see, well, good, I feel deficient. I feel like I want love. I feel like I want intimacy. I feel like I want pleasure. That's all for me. And then St. Paul comes in and says, no, stop it! It is not right! Self-gift, self-gift, self-gift. It's, it's, it's all about Self-gift. This is the Christian approach to marriage. This is the Christian approach to sexuality. It always has to be self-gift. And, and this is why this passage by St. Paul is so key. Because this, and I, it actually continues if you want to keep reading. I'll just go back and forth between them. Um, it's long, but it's important. What's most important here is that he makes an analogy between man and woman, husband and wife, and between Christ and the church. And this is the depth, this is the pinnacle, the acme of the church's sexual teaching. Is that man and woman, husband and wife, mirror Christ and the church. Christ did not create the church for his own glory. The church does not worship Christ so that she can feel good about herself. They give themselves to each other. Christ gave himself on the cross for the church. The church gives herself to Christ in every action of the church, in every prayer, in every liturgy, and most especially during the Mass. When the priest lifts up the host and offers Christ back to God, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, that motion, that action, is the complete self-gift of Christ, as head of the church, to the Father. Right? But it's also, in a very real sense, we're offering ourselves to God. We're offering, as the church, ourselves back to Christ. And so, this is the analogy that St. Paul makes. Is it on this slide or the other one? Is this the one that talks about the bride? Yes, it is. Good. No. It's the other one. Of course it is. Of course it is. It always is. 
Okay. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So lest we get caught in gender politics, let's focus on this line real quick. Christ died for the church. All right? It is, it is to the point of death. Christ did not demand power over his apostles. Christ did not say, you have to do everything that I say because I'm more powerful than you. Right? Christ died for the church. That is the love that husbands are asked for here. So, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to that he might present the church. So it's weird because he switches between husbands and Christ. He's really talking about Christ here. Uh, because Christ cleanses with the washing of water and the word. That's, and he's cleansing the church. Uh, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That's the idea. That's the self-gift. And that's why brides wear white on their wedding day. Because of this passage, among other things. Um, it's partially related to baptism, but it's really this passage. right? It's this idea that we as the church need to be spotless and unblemished, and that's the state in which we offer ourselves to Christ. Well, similarly with husbands and wives, it's this mutual self-gift. It's this mutual self-gift model on Jesus. Model on the relationship between Jesus and the church. Now, St. Paul tries to keep an analogy, you know, husbands are Christ, wives are the church. I don't think we need to stick to a strict interpretation of that. Um, I don't think that's necessary. What's necessary, again, how we read scripture, what is St. Paul trying to say? <clears throat> this passage is actually about Christ and the church. It's he, Paul is really annoying to read. I don't know if you've read his letters, but he's like my least favorite biblical author. Because here's what he does. Right? He goes on a rant. He's like, okay, so these are all the things that you Ephesians need to do, and it's really important. And then, like, husbands, you, you know, be mutual subject to each other. Husbands love your wives. Wives love your husbands. And, like, man, Christ loves the church, and it's so cool, and I love to see that. And he just, like, rants. He just goes on, and he doesn't, he doesn't have a logical thought pattern. So that's what's going on here. He starts with, like, these are the requirements. This is what you have to do. But then he's like, oh, but look how beautiful it is. Let's talk about Christ and the church. And he kind of mixes them in and around. And so that's what's going on here. The real thing about husbands and wives is the first, you know, few lines. Be subject to each other. Be mutually subject to each other. Self-gift, self-gift, self-gift. And then he kind of, okay, makes it in. Now we're talking about the church and Christ. Now we're talking about husbands and wives. So just be careful when you read this as far as that goes. But the point, and it's, this is why, like, when, when couples choose this reading for their, for their wedding, people are like, oh, you're just trying to live in the 1950s, aren't you? And, and I'm just like, oh, this, this reading doesn't get enough love. It doesn't get enough love. It's so good. It's so important for our sexual ethic, right? It's mutual self-gift. Christ and the church giving to each other completely, entirely. Christ and the church. That's where we are. Good. I think, I, you know, I could just go on and on about this. It's really good. Um, and, then, and then here we have consummatum est. So... I put this because this is the end of my presentation. It's a Latin for it is finished. Interesting, though. Consumatum. It's like we've heard that word in the context of marriage before as well. It's amazing that this should be the word that Christ says on the cross. It is consummated. On the cross, when he dies, it is consummated as though at a wedding. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, uh, I'm going to make... Two points really quickly because I should probably address them. <sighs> yeah, I should probably address them and then I'll take questions. So you'll notice I gave us the overview, the really deep theology, and I really avoided talking about specific issues because those all make us uncomfortable and sometimes we have strong emotions around them. But it would be a disservice to you not to talk about those. So I'm going to go through them very quickly using these principles ask questions when I'm done, and then ask questions next week, because next week is a little bit on just war and social justice, and then we're also just going to do hard cases and questions. So it's going to be great. <clears throat> so all of the things the church says are wrong are because they don't completely express 
the full self-gift that we're talking about here in Ephesians and Theology of the Body. You can make natural law arguments. We've done that till our face was blue. I don't think they're helpful within the church. Outside the church, they're the only thing we have, so we do them as best we can. But within the church, it's really this idea of self-gift. This is what we're going to talk about. So when the church talks about fornication being wrong, this is sex outside of marriage, right? Fornication is wrong because it's not complete self-gift, right? Your body is making a promise that your soul has not made. You are self-giving a little bit, right? You're giving yourself physically and completely physically, right? This is the most intimate physical act that you can have, uh, you know, from an objective standpoint, I don't, from an objective standpoint. Um, but if you're not married, if you have not made that commitment that I'm going to be with you for life, then you're, it's really not a self-gift. It's a partial gift. It's a little bit of a gift, but it's a gift you can take away. It's a gift that you can, you can revoke whenever, you, whenever it suits your fancy. So that's why we don't like fornication. We don't like adultery because you have taken the self-gift that you've promised, the complete self-gift, that is the ideal of marriage, and you've split it. Now it's half gift to you and half gift to you. And, and it's, one, it's not a complete self-gift with the, the person who's not part of marriage, but two, it has destroyed the self-gift in the normal marriage. Um, when we talk to couples who experience the pain of adultery, we do try to help them heal, right? That doesn't end the marriage necessarily. So the self-gift has been, has been taken away, and it's a long and arduous process to help the couple trust again with that idea of giving to each other. So we understand that. But, but anyway, that's why we say it's wrong, because again, it violates self-gift. Everything violates self-gift. Um, birth control. So birth control, the natural argument, the natural law, I should speak slower. The natural law argument makes more sense because it's more obvious, right? <clears throat> God intended the reproductive act to be part of reproduction. I say that specifically because the cycle of a woman's body does not always allow for reproduction at all times. Not every conjugal act results in a baby. It's just the natural cycle of things, right? There's a certain, if you take an NFB class, as you know, there's this great little window where that's baby time. And then everything else is like, maybe not. We look at that and we actually say that's probably part of God's plan, that not every every conjugal action results in a child. That doesn't seem to be a corruption of nature. It's built into the true cycle of the human person, and we can't say that cycle is corrupted or diseased. So, we say that the reproductive act needs to be part of the conjugal act, right? <clears throat> Essentially, following the formula or the recipe for reproduction. Whether it results in reproduction or not is immaterial, as long as you follow the recipe. Um, and if you follow the recipe, then you, again, last week with intention, I'll get you in a second, don't, don't make your hand tired. Um, if you follow the recipe, that's intention. You have intended to follow the plan, come what may. And so that's really all we ask. So that's why we would oppose birth control, because birth control, like, scratches out a really important part of that recipe. Even though you, you do the reproductive act, you know and have intended that the reproductive act should be should be foiled through artificial means. With the with the woman's cycle, there are times in the cycle where that's going to be true, and if that's part of God's plan, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to use that plan. That's why the church thinks re that NFP is okay, even though it says, well, we're we're planning not to have a child, so it feels like birth control, but it it following God's plan as much as possible. Um, it's it's using God's plan. Whereas artificial chemicals and especially barriers that aren't chemical at all, like these things artificially interrupt and play with God's plan in a way that we don't think is licit. And also with this idea of self-gift, the reproductive act, we say open to children, that's actually a mistranslation of human vitae. Talk to me about that later. Um, so it's not like you have to intend to have children every time the conjugal act happens because, again, not part of God's plan, um, that every act should result in children. So that intention doesn't have to be there, but to, 
to use a device that would take the natural cycle and say, oh, the cycle's not good enough. We're going to make sure that the cycle never matters. We don't have to pay attention to it. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want. That, that in a sense, isn't that self-gift anymore because self-gift has to be modeling Christ in his church. It has to be following God's plan. So, so is that, um, and then when it comes to the church's teachings on homosexuality, it really comes down to this idea of complementarity, right? We have these internal desires, you know, the church and the catechism is very clear that we don't presume to know where the desires come from. Maybe it's genetics, maybe it's birth, maybe it's early childhood development. We're not going to presume. What we are going to presume to know is to say, in the act of sexual self-gift, right, that act of complete self-gift in the conjugal act, the complementarity of the two parties is essential. Not just biologically, because of the recipe and the way these organs are intended, but, but entirely. That complementarity is not present, and so that, that complete reunification in one flesh is not, is not brought about to the level that we would say justifies sexual activity, is basically what we say. You know, uh, those desires can lead to friendship, they can lead to deep emotional intimacy, but it doesn't reach the level of complementarity where it would justify sexual activity. Okay, good. I'm going to take questions for five minutes. Oh, who do I have to apologize to? I forgot to pray beforehand. Somebody told, reminded me to do that. Ah, oh, I am so sorry. We will pray at the end. So I'm going to take questions for five minutes, and then we're going to pray at the end. Yes? Um, so with the fornications, mm -hmm. um, if you end up marrying that person, does that make it not as bad? Or? It doesn't. It, it doesn't diminish the act because with the vocabulary from last week we have to look at the act itself and so in that moment of the sexual act there was not complete self-gift because if you really intended to give yourself fully to that person you would have made the vow at the altar so that's why eloping is a thing because they're like all right i gotta make the vow first and then we're gonna but don't do that get married in the church take the six months of marriage right <laughs> Um, and it's because the act in itself is what would tear the soul apart. That's dehumanizing. So even if later it turns out that there is a full act of self-gift, you have still held something back in that moment that tears your soul. And that's what we would talk about as sin. Yes? Well, I don't know what you might, so much a question as a kind of an example. But um, you were talking about having relations without without being married. It's kind of like making cookie dough without finishing and baking the cookies. It's kind of like that. <laughs>